Good morning. Good morning. I got to tell you, I love it that you guys enjoy visiting with each, blah, visiting with each other. Uh, it's nice to talk to your brothers and sisters, isn't it? Hey, coming up this, uh, well, the Spring Mission Ministry newsletter are back, and they're available in the foyer if you want to pick that up. Uh, Ladies' Day is April 20th. Uh, your deadline to register is the 10th. What was that, Wednesday? Yeah. <clears throat> Junior Choir presentation on the 28th. That's coming up. And OVCA needs hamburgers, hamburger pickles, mustard, mayo, and ketchup. So uh, let's, uh, let's see what we can do to make that happen as well. All right. God is good. All the time. Let's be standing, please. God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good all the time. Through the darkest night, His light will shine. God is good. God is good all the time. If you're walking through the valley, there are shadows all around. Do not fear, He will guide you. He will keep you safe and sound. He has promised to never leave you nor forsake you. And His word is true. God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good. All the time, through the darkest night, His light will shine. God is good. God is good all the time. We were sinners, so unworthy. Still for us, He chose to die. Filled us with His Holy Spirit. Now we can stand and testify. John 14, 23, join with me, please. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, Lord, help us. Lord, help us to show our love by doing what you ask us to do. Lord, help us to always be looking out for that opportunity, that opportunity to serve you, Lord, by serving others. Lord, right now, we just want to lift you up. We want to praise your name. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Praises and blessings. Blanche. Another new great-granddaughter, six great-grandchildren. Millie McKenna Boatman. All right. Congratulations. All right. Anybody else got something they want to praise the Lord about this morning? Yes. Well, I didn't have my surgery. Praise the Lord. 
Praise the Lord. Are you going to have your surgery? Yes, the 29th. The 29th, okay. All right. Yes, Susie. Tony has some blessings. Oh, boy, you got to put on the spot there. One doctor I never had to see again. What's that? You don't have to see the guy that did your hip anymore. All right. Good, good, good. And you got, the, you got rid of a medication too? All right. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right. Bonnie, you sound excited. God's good. Amen. Anybody else? She's going to get the last word, I can tell right now. Anybody else? All right. <clears throat> Lee Foss, heart attack and cancer starts radiation next week. Being prayer for him. Flood victims. Uh, there's a lot of people doing some cleanup, and, and I, I understand there's a couple of people that have drowned uh, in regard to this too. So let's be in prayer for these people. Mary Shaner, she's got advanced Alzheimer's and she's on, on hospice. That is your, uh, your aunt, right? Mark. Yeah, Mark's wife, okay. Eric Keffer, last treatment for pancreatic cancer and upcoming treatment reevaluation. Let, let's pray that uh, Eric's uh, results are good. Gary Swartz, I know that's hard to believe that he does have a heart Gary, I thought you might appreciate that. He's at home watching. Uh, so he went in and, and uh, well, you can see a five cents, a heart ablation, and a pacemaker later. And he's at home. So he's, he's doing pretty well since they've got him at home. Uh, Brandon Stencil moved to rehab to recover from injuries. Ruby Gephardt, that's my aunt. She's been in the hospital. She got back to the nursing home on Friday night about 11 o'clock. Uh, keep praying for her. Um, she's, uh, she's got some mental things going on there. Mike Landing had some chest pains and had a cart, heart cath or? Yes, he had one. Okay. So he's okay. All right. It was good? It was good. All right. Well, that's good. All right. Tom Walsh, <clears throat> this, let me back up. Uh, Jamie Walsh, uh, this is my cousin. Uh, she's in a high-risk pregnancy. So uh, be praying for her. Mom said uh, this one wasn't ordered. So <laughs> Tom, Walsh, Tom Walsh would be Jamie's father-in-law, and he had a heart surgery, and I think he is improving. Uh, so but keep pray, or pray for that guy. Let's see here. Juanita Webb fell and shattered her femur. Uh, let's see. Will be, she'll be 90 uh, in June, it looks like. And I think, would they, six month recovery? Three years. Six months or a year for that to heal up. So let's be praying for her. Uh, let's see. And the family of Linda Garrett. This is Diane Reidenauer's aunt. And Garrett Breen is doing fine, so we can remove him. All right. Anybody else to add to the prayer list this morning? Bobby Lamasters, after we sing, would you offer up prayer for those on our prayer list? Let's be standing again, please.
You may be seated. church. I'm going to steal that from Jimmy. Jimmy's made that pretty popular in this church. So. Well, I appreciate hearing that, Jimmy. I appreciate that. I'm going to first reading I'm having this morning is be for Deuteronomy 15 verses 10 and 11. Give generously to him so without a grudgingly heart and because of this the Lord your God will bless you and all your work and everything you put your hand to. You know, God doesn't need our, our offering, but he needs our, our commitment, and he needs our heart to be in the right place. And, you know, that's grudgingly. Uh, it's not going to do you any good. It's not going to do God any good. But we need to change, have a heart change in that. Now, in 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 to 11, the reason I chose this verse is because it's spring of the year, time to sow seed. Grass seed, that's when you want to grass and oats. Another month be planting corn. So it's the time of the year for sowing and how God, I won't use this scripture here to tie, tie it in. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided <coughs> in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. Remember who you say that all the time? <laughs> Don Moster, Don Moster always used to say, God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having it all you need, you will abound in every good work, as it is written. He has scattered broad his gifts to the poor, his righteous doors forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower, and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed. And will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will, not, you will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity result in thanksgiving to God. I used an example a few years ago about taking one kernel of corn, planting that kernel of corn. Hopefully, if you get the water, God supplies the water and the sunshine, the earth warms, that seed will germinate. It'll produce a stalk of corn. Hope there'll be at least one ear on that corn stock corn, sometimes two or three. That one kernel of corn will produce on one ear of corn five to six hundred kernels of corn. One seed will produce that many kernels on one ear of corn. Just think about that. <laughs> so when we give this morning, you know, if you hold back and say, oh, I can't afford it, you can't afford not to give. But God will bless you. So let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this opportunity today to to be in his house, to be able to, to come to you in prayer and to offer up our prayers of thanks for the way you've blessed us. Fathers, we give this morning, we're reminded of how much you've blessed us with and that we don't actually own it, we're just using it while we're here. We pray your blessings upon the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Wasn't made to 
to be tending a grave. I was called by name, born and raised back to life again. I was made for more. So why would I make a bed in my shame when a fountain of grace is running my way? I know I am yours, and I was made. The cross of salvation was only the start. Now I am chosen, free and forgiven. I have a future, and it's worth.
Hey, here's a thought that might make your uh, might make you stagger just a little bit. Maybe you just go, "What the what?" Right? I like those kind of thoughts, especially when it comes to the true and living God. And here, here's the thought: uh, if if you're in Christ, right? If if You've been united with Christ in his death, into his burial, and have been raised by the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. That's what I mean. If you're in Christ, then the God of the highest heavens has made his residency, his home in our hearts. Is that not staggering to you? Does that not give you chill bumps a little bit? That the God that created everything that is seen and unseen, the one who spoke and things came into existence, you've heard it said previously, the greatest miracle that ever occurs, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Ex nihilo, out of nothing. And he... He dwells in us. The Holy Spirit, my friends, has moved in, so to speak. Filling our souls, halls, and our rooms with Himself. Music, dancing. Jesus said it, and we, we said it to one another just a little while ago, these words from John 14. You know, He's preparing His disciples for His departure. And he says, you know what, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we, plural, we <laughs> will come to him and make our home with him. Is that not amazing? I find that crazy. But in a, in a cool kind of way because it's, it's reality. You see, in Christ, not only do we have a home in heaven then, we have a home with God now. Jesus said in the same chapter, uh, the first part of the chapter, verse 2 of John 4, 14, he says, listen, in my Father's house are many rooms. Or many mansions. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? You see, heaven has made a home right here, right now. You know why? Because it takes a supernatural act to redeem you, all right? And it's going to take a supernatural act, God Himself with us to see us safely from here to there. And you can find all kinds of shadows and types throughout the Bible when God brought Israel up out of Egypt. He led them by a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. His presence was always there. Just look for those types and shadows and, and see what we're feeling right now. We're feeling some of the warmth of our Father's fireplace did you did y'all have some cool evenings the last several days yeah and, and not only cool but damp and when it's damp and cool then you you get that chill that sets into your bones and you can't escape it am i the only one that shudders with struggles with that and you get the chills and your teeth are chattering and you can't do anything about it other than shake and everybody thinks you having some kind of seizure or something no you're just chilly you're cold Right? That's the world we live in. But what God has done by making His home in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, we begin to feel some of the warmth of our Father's fireplace and hear some of the music cascading down the halls. Did y'all enjoy music this morning and the special just a few moments ago? Right? Those are just little tastes of, of what God is doing. Hear some of the music cascading down the halls and smell some of the food from, uh, from his kitchen because the very spirit 
of that home is here. Uh, we have grandkids this week. I, I, I wish they'd just move in with us, really. I think there are times where parents would like that, but I haven't gotten them to the place just to sign all the paperwork yet. I'm looking forward to that. They'll probably be 14, 15 when nobody will want them, right? No, I'll want them even then. The other day, I put some bacon in a frying pan. 45 seconds of heat. And my partner in crime, Wiwi, comes to the kitchen and goes, I smell bacon. And his little eyes rolled in the back of his head. And he slobbered a little bit. Sorry, Wyatt, but he did. He slobbered just a little bit. All right, that's, that's the picture I want to paint for you what it's like when the Spirit takes up residence. The, the music is playing down the halls. We smell his food. It's warm, right? It's comfortable. And you see, before the Spirit brings us to heaven, which is his goal, before the Spirit brings us to heaven, he brings something of heaven to us right now. Because life is hard. Have y'all realized that? It's difficult and we struggle and, and, and these bodies break down and relationships break down. So I guess it's foolish to ignore or to refuse this glorious guest. And I want to I want to learn how to happily host him well that not only is he welcome here but he can take his shoes off make yourself at home feel free so here's where i'd like us to go i want i want to i want to explore this idea of entertaining the holy spirit now by that i don't i don't mean that you're you're constantly making sure that there are things that, that he's involved in, like, you know, binging Netflix or scrolling through Facebook or, or tweeting. Do they still tweet even though it's X? What do they call it now? I don't know. But anyway, whatever, he's, he's, that's not what I mean. You don't have to, like, make an itinerary for him. So let me give you a little bit of an idea what I mean when we talk about and when Scripture talks about entertaining the Holy Spirit, I think it's simply referred to us as showing Him hospitality. Now again, I don't mean that you have to make sure his, his sweet, glass, sweet tea glass is full all the time and he's got a cookie in one hand and a bacon sandwich in the other hand and, and you're dabbing his, his, his lips. and you're, you're in, enjoy, That's not what I mean either. Here's what I mean. What I mean by entertaining or showing hospitality to the Holy Spirit is where we open our hearts and our lives to Him. As Isaiah did in Isaiah 6, when in the year that King Uzziah died, you remember reading that text? He says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and His glory filled the entire temple. And God says, who will I send and who will go for me? And, and, and Isaiah looked around. He was the only one in the room. He says, well, here I am, Lord. Yielded, will, willing, right? You see, if the Holy Spirit dwells in us, and you remember we asked those if questions last week in Romans chapter 8, verses 9, 10, and 11. If, if the Holy Spirit uh, dwells in you, right, then our great duty and... Better than that, our great joy is to entertain Him, to welcome Him, to open up our hearts and lives to Him. You know the song, right? Where He leads me, I will follow. I'll go with, with all the way. That's what we're talking about here. Right? That's what we're talking about here. So our great duty and our, and our joy is to entertain Him, to welcome Him, to open our hearts and lives to Him, to lovingly host Him until we land in paradise. Until we're done. Until we're out of gas. Until the whistle blows. 
right? That's by design. That, that's, that's what God sends the Holy Spirit to do, to take what was Jesus and give it to us so that we might endure this world even as Jesus endured this world. God's not left anything to chance if we'll just open ourselves up to him. So the question becomes, okay, how's that happen? How do I make that happen? Well, let me, let me offer you four pieces of counsel as a pattern or a path or suggestions. You take it however you want on spiritual hospitality, all right? I think the, I think the greatest place to start is to hear. You know, James says that we should be quick to hear, right? We're quick to listen. So I think it starts with hearing his voice, recognizing when he speaks, right? Because there's all kinds of racket in your world. You're being bombarded from all corners, northeast, south, and west, with all kinds of, of noise and information and data. It's just coming at you so fast, right? And the Spirit, like the best guests, comes to speak with us. Could you imagine inviting your friends over and all you did was stare at each other all day long? That'd be kind of creepy, wouldn't it? But the Spirit, like best guests, come to speak with us. And though He may at times impart a prophetic word, you know, Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 12, He might come to to give utterance uh, through the Spirit in 1 first, first Corinthians 12, 8, uh, where it says, uh, for one who's given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom and another the utterance of knowledge according to the Spirit. He, he shows up and, and speaks through people, which is, which is great. To another, he, he, uh, the working of miracles, another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, on and on and on. I mean, those are, those are valuable and there's a place for that. But he speaks most clearly and with the greatest authority in the pages of Scripture through his word. You know, you know Hebrews 4.12, right? Sure you do. Because Hebrews 4.12 says that all Scripture is breathed out by God. Is breathed out by God. And it's profitable. It'll benefit you. It, it, it will help you become what you were designed to become. It's going to teach you. It's going to reprove you. It's going to correct you. It's going to train you in the ways of Christ. And Peter comes along and says that, you know, there's no prophet spoke of his own will, but he was carried along by the Holy Spirit. Right? So think of that. There's that idea of wind, breath, Spirit, river. And for those who have an ear to hear, Hebrews 4.12 says that those words, that word is living and active. That doesn't mean it changes with the, with the seasons or the times, but it's living and active. It's never dead. It's not a dead letter. And that, that phraseology, living inactive, it's perpetual perpetuation. It's always there, right when you need it, exactly on the right time. You see, the Spirit's breath is still warm on these words, even though many of them were written four, 5,000 years ago. It's the most contemporary document you will ever uh, read. So, read the Bible. I think read the Bible is, I suppose, old counsel for most of us. But may I alert you to a couple of common ways we read Scripture with earmuffs on. A couple of common ways that we read Scriptures with muffled ears to the Spirit. One is by hearing selectively. And I really don't think I want to hear that right now. Right? Ever, ever, has that ever happened to you? You hear the blah, 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 blah. Hungry. Uh, you picked up the hungry, but you forgot all the blah, blah, blahs. 
in the middle. So, and, and we do that to God's Word sometimes. We hear it selectively. We want to hear what we want to hear, when we want to hear it, and how we want to hear it, and to the degree that we want to hear it. Welcome to human nature, right? And hearing superficially. That is, just sticking your toe in. Right? Oh, on occasion. Oh, every once in a while. And, and you're just, just cracking, cracking the surface without completely diving in. You know, that's dangerous. It's a dangerous grieving of the Spirit when instead of drawing ourselves to the Spirit to hear from Him, we labor to draw the Spirit of God to us. The same Spirit that brooded over the deep. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. We want Him to serve our wants and the needs. How easily I forget that His Word is living and active and is sharper than any two double-edged sword that's ever been created. And the Spirit wields a weapon. And if His wounds never, if His words never wound me, then subsequently heal me. I'm really not hearing his voice, right? So be careful. Another uh, way whereby we commonly grieve the Spirit of God is that we are troubled with a multitude of business. And Jesus said it himself in, in Mark chapter 4 in the parable of the soils, you, you recall. The, the multitude of business begets multitudes of passions and distractions that when God's Spirit dictates the best things that tend to our comfort and peace, we, we, we just ain't got time for that. We do the sweet brown, right? We, and ain't nobody got time for that. We got to keep going. And Jesus warns and says, now listen, the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desires of other things will choke out the word right we may hear the word and in a quick cursory way as sometimes i hear my wife while rushing out the door she told me something important yeah 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 i got it i got it i got it what happens in the next 10 15 minutes i don't got it right Am I the only one guilty of this? I mean, I'm turning myself in. There are times I do not hear her because I'm, I'm so focused on something else that may or may not be as important, but we have no time to hear. And we, we're hurried and distracted. And so there's no room for the Holy Spirit to sink in. You see, hearing the Spirit... Really hearing him takes humility, time, and quietness, a stillness, if you will, a being settled. Just as hearing your spouse or friend does. Listen to hear, listen to understand. Many of us like to listen in order to respond. So we're already, we're already thinking our thoughts up. I'm one of those I, I struggle with. But to listen, to understand. And I think we do well then first thing in the morning and perhaps key moments throughout the day to dismiss all other company, all other business <coughs> from the soul and invite the Holy Spirit to speak. I don't care what you're doing. If you're killing snakes or skinning cats, whatever you're doing, take a little break and let God in. Even in those moments where you just can't. We're, we're cleaning up from a flood. We're getting ready to move because of a flood. Well, there's got to be a moment in there that, that you can reconnect. So that's one. Here's a second one I would offer you. And that is to heed his motions. Intimate, intimately related to the Spirit's voice are the Spirit's motions. And 
by motions. Uh, that's not what some call today as impressions. I don't mean impressions. I mean, you can eat a bad cabbage roll and get motion and impressions. That's not what I mean. Uh, but I mean like conviction. All right? Motions are spiritual promptings to apply a specific part of Scripture. All right? Did you hear what Randy said just a few moments ago? He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Now apply that, right? Uh, and a kernel of corn potentially can make anywhere from 500 to 2,000 of itself if if all the conditions are right right so the idea here is is to stop and to take a specific part of a scripture passage and plug it in to a specific part of your life for example uh, let's say you hear a you hear a sermon or, or teaching on humility or gentleness, as it's happened recently, and you sense your negligence in this spiritual discipline, and you feel the need to change. You ever you ever heard something like, "Oh, I need to do something about that," right? And and you may in that moment be feeling one of the spirit's motions. Sent to, make work, sent to make way for God in our hearts. Now the question is, okay, Zach, what are you going to do with it? And I think we can resonate with this. Fellow says this, Mr. Sib says this, how many holy motions are kindled in hearing the word and participating in communion and singing worshipful, worshipful songs, etc., which die as soon as is they are kindled for want of resolution. In other words, church over, sermon over, singing done, communion done, and we leave the gathering, and we get caught up in the current of the day and forget what we are have felt and heard. Anyone ever do that? That's why James comes along and says, look, be doers of the word. Not just hearers only. Hear it, yes, but become doers. And the Spirit has invited us to enjoy more of His presence and more of His power. The same Spirit that brooded over the deep and the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. What kind of potency do we have available to us? Do you see where I'm going with this? So how then do we heed the Spirit's motions? I think through what Paul calls in 2 Thessalonians 1, a resolve for good. I don't talk about New Year's resolutions and things like that, but a determination, a resolve, a stubbornness, if you will. Remember when, when Jacob was going back to see his brother after that long period of time? Remember that? And Jacob was scared to go see Esau. Remember that? Esau's going to, oh, he's going to do me in. I hoodwinked him. I pin hooked him. I got it all. He still got to be mad about it. So Jacob spends a whole night in prayer. He doesn't sleep. Camps out away from his brother's place. Spends all night in prayer. God sees his travail and it takes pity on him, right? Comes down and, and, and they have this conversation. God sends an angel down there. And what Jacob does, he latches hold of that angel and will not let go. All night he wrestled him. All night he was just, just up in his elbow, up in his face, would not let go. And the angels finally touched his hip, threw his hip out of socket. Have you ever dislocated a joint? Oh. Knocked his hip out of his joint. 
The Bible says that from that point on, Jacob walked with a limp. Well, duh. An angel knock you sit back, your hip out of joint. You're going you're gonna to have a limp. But Jacob would not let go. That's what I mean by resolve. All right? A holy resolution, if you will. It, 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 is this my duty? Well, I'm going to do it. I'm going to pursue it. So, let's not let these motions die in us. Sermon over. Leave the gathering. Now, we may tell a trusted friend what we felt or seen. But what I'm talking about is discerning if the motion was truly spiritual. Is, is this God speaking? If it is, His Word will confirm it. If, if it's not found in His Word, throw it away. Right? So this is part, I think, of what Paul is saying to the Philippian church where he tells them how that we're to roll with this salvation. Because the Philippian church was, was a cool place, but they had their problems too. He says, I want you to listen to these words, not just in my presence, but, but even much more in my absence, that you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. In other words, you get the idea, the impression of what it's like, and then you work out that implication as time goes on. How many of y'all have been married more than 10 years in this room? Several of you, right? Did you understand what it meant to be a husband or wife when you first started? Oh, you thought you did, didn't you? Have you found any surprises along the way? Any disappointments along the way? Any controversy along the way? Any conflict? Surely not. When I hear people say, oh, we've been married for 40 years and we've not had the first argument. My question is, do y'all live in the same house? <laughs> right? You've got to live someplace else. Do you live in a doghouse or the barn and she lives in a mansion? What is it? You cannot put two people together in that proximity and not have conflict. That's why God gave us Song of Solomons. Song of Songs, the Song of Solomon. So, anyway, laboring to open every door to him. Here's, here's the third thing, and I think this is important, and that is to hate his enemies with a purple passion. And what I'm saying is this. Opening every door to him, when I open the doors of my heart to him, I'm saying no to anything that is contrary to him. Does that make sense? It's part of being led by the Spirit. You say, but I sin all the time. <laughs> I know. So do I. That's why we want to create a habitation of the Spirit where that sin becomes, it's never ever going to go away, folks, but it becomes less and less. Right? It doesn't eat you like it used to. Who will think of himself well entertained into a house when there shall be entertainment given to the greatest enemy with him, and he's given more regard than the master of the house. You see, holiness is far more than keeping some abstract laws. It, it, it is keeping the law, for sure, but it's more to it, right? A bank robber can go and knock off a bank and then drive the speed limit and not get pulled over by the highway patrolman. He's still in mess, right? He's still in trouble. He's still a lawbreaker. Same way with us. Holiness is far more than keeping some abstract law or code of conduct. Holiness begins with good hospitality, the opening of our hearts and our lives to him. How many of our excuses for sin would wither and die if we remembered the holy guest that's in our soul? Where can we go from His Spirit? Or where can we flee from His presence? If we ascend to the angry heights, He's there. If we make our bed in hidden fantasies, He's there. If we take the wings of the morning and sin where no human eyes see me sin, even there He's with me. And even there His heart grieves. 
Paul says to the Ephesian church, don't grieve the Holy Spirit whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So take heed to those little sins, right? Which we count lesser sins perhaps than God does. Yes, take heed of the little, little sins. Every sin, if given in entertainment, will seek to destroy everything that the Spirit is working on. So take heed of gossip, borderline shows. Take heed of greed and second glances. Take heed of bitterness and snap judgments. Take heed as you would a, of a thief at your door. And the council will not sound too strict to those who have enjoyed the Spirit's fellowship. You see, when he's the master of the house, all his enemies and pests, like flies and stink bugs. Do y'all still have stink bugs in your house? Like flies and stink bugs and multicolored lady Asian beetles and wasps and mice, all those things that just pester you to death. If he's inside and he's the master of the house, they're outside. And the music plays and the feast is spread and the fires blaze and the soul rests happy at home. And so, would you not hesitate to say this, Romans 8, 13? Would you not? I, I, we will not hesitate to say, well, come and help me kill these folks. Because Paul says that if we live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if according to the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Here's the final thing I would say. And that is, have, possess, relish, enjoy His grace. Of course, anyone who's entertained the Spirit knows what it feels like to grieve the Spirit, to stifle His voice, to kill His motions. If you've been a believer any length of time, you've done all this stuff. Welcome his enemies. And yet, even in the after warmth of those miserable moments, we need not to wait to entertain him again, or worse, try to work our way back to welcome. We can stop and entertain him right here, right now. He will never say no. Have you read Luke 15? You want to come home. He invites you. So to entertain, entertain the Spirit is, in essence, to welcome the Spirit in His various offices. And His most precious office is to glorify Jesus. That's what Jesus said in John 16, 14. The Spirit's going to come. He's going to take what is mine and declare it to you. And we're never more hospitable, therefore, than when we let Him lift our eyes to Christ. I think it's the happiest condition in the world to be in Christ. When the soul is the temple of the Holy Spirit, when the heart is as the holy of holies was to the Israel nation, where there be prayers and praise and worship offered to God, while the Spirit and His motions are entertained by us, we shall be happy, satisfied in life, happy in death, Happy in eternity. The deepest, most durable happiness. A hint of heaven's own joy can be felt here below all because God dwells in us. So take courage, church. God's got you right where you, you can be the most blessed, most and He can get you can get the most good and He can get the most glory you're apart from Christ, I don't want you leaving that way this morning because if you're apart from Christ, well, the Spirit can't rest in you, can't dwell in you. Peter was asked the question, men and brethren, what must we do to be saved? And, Jesus, and Peter replied, repent every one of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Is that where you are this morning? If you are, we got everything ready. Don't worry about this monstrosity behind me. Just a half a dozen wing nuts, and we can get that baby down. So if you have a decision to make this morning, there's room at the cross for you. Let's stand and sing together, okay?
morning. As I read the read through the Bible, it always amazes me and how God uses metaphors, similes, and parables to to help teach difficult topics to to people and real using real life situations. And I, I think about Paul when he was in prison and attached to a guard for two years. And you think of what he observed at that time. And, and in Ephesians 6, 13 through 17. Therefore put on all your full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you, have, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have, some, have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with the feet, with your feet fitted with readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And how, how Paul tied this in with with his daily life. And then we go into Matthew and we read the, we go into Matthew and we read the parables and you, you read the parable of the sower, of sowing seed, as Randy mentioned earlier. And, and we have the parable of the, the mustard seed, the tiny mustard seed and the yeast mixed in. But then we read in the parable of the fishing net in Matthew 13. Matthew 13 verses 47 and 48. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled up, pulled it to shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in the basket, but threw the bad ones away. And finally, you know, as, as, we, as we come to this time, or as we gather around here, you know, in John, John 6, he talks about um, eating the flesh and drinking his blood. And, and the people at this time, they, they had no idea what, what he was talking about. And if we read here in, in John 6, Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. And you think about that, and they had no idea what, what he was talking about. But, you know, we don't need the parables anymore and the metaphors because God has given us his, his word, his book, and we can read it every day. And he explains to us everything that we are dealing with. And the eating of, of his body is coming to Christ. And the drinking of his blood is believing in him. And as we, as we bow our heads, keep that in mind that we want to draw close to him at this time and we want to believe in him and accept him as our personal savior. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we have together here. We thank you for sending your one and only son to this earth for us. For we are so unworthy of the blessings that you've bestowed upon us. And we thank you for all that you do for us. And we ask you, dear Lord, to use this time to draw us closer. To the clear of our, our hearts of all the cloudiness and things that are there. And to draw us closer and closer to you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's be standing, please. I forgot to mention Bill Shackle texted this. Sorry, Bill. Uh, Bill's at home. Uh, he is uh, starting home health care this week, and he says meals are not needed, he says. So don't bring him any food. <laughs> yeah, he said, uh, I was talking to him, he said he had enough food for Tuesday, and I said, that was Friday I talked to him, and I said, well, I can come over right now, and he's like, no. So, uh, yeah, he needs to recoup a little bit. Thanks, by the way, for all y'all do and uh, making sure folks are fed up and taken care of and all that. So, that, add a boy, add a girl. Let me pray. We'll call it a morning. Rehearsals and such this evening. Worship at six. So uh, we'll see you. See you after a bit. Let's pray. Father. Thank you for not leaving anything to chance. That you have moved heaven and earth to come to us in order that we might be drawn to you through the gospel. Thank you for a little bit of heaven that you've planted in our hearts as uh, we live in a crooked and depraved world. For crying out loud, we're crooked and depraved ourselves between our ears. Thank you for the gifts that you give us. May they affect us from the balls of our feet to the tops of our head. And may our love for you be seen in how we love each other. And it's through Christ I pray. Amen. Amen. Share God's love this week. <laughs>